record on your computer. Okay, cool. Um, is that better for the start? That's perfect, yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm going to do a quick intro so it'll give people a few more minutes and you all can settle in and then we are going to get started right away. So thanks all for joining. It's really nice to see a lot of familiar but some new faces as well. So for those who haven't been following along, well, the last 12 weeks uh, has, has been an inner and outer transformation. I think we've all been following along on the outer transformation, so it feels really nice to be together. But I wanted to give uh, some of you all the inside scoop on an inner 12-week transformation that's been happening. And that's uh, a really beautiful, dedicated group of students, many who I see here tonight, who have been, sorry, I muted you all temporarily. Um, but a group of students who've been engaging with the Dharma at Three Jewels, um, and specifically the, the source of our Dharma is the Asian Classics Institute, which I'll give a little bit of an intro on that. But a group of students uh, within this lovely Zoom meeting have been meeting every Tuesday for the last 12 weeks. So we started off in studio without skipping a beat. We transferred here to our virtual world. And we've been meeting and discussing, debating, memorizing uh, the Dharma, coming to meet the Dharma, really. And we're so grateful. For, we're going to get into what Dharma is um, kind of in an embodied experience. But for now, let's just work with the, the definition of Dharma is this radical but completely available to all of us technology to change the way we experience the world. And by that virtue, change the, the being that we are, our way of being. And so the source of Dharma for Three Jewels, as I mentioned, is ACI or the Asian Classics Institute. I want to make sure you all know about it. I know many of you already know and love ACI, but for those of you who don't know, the Asian Classics Institute preserves really the curriculum that a Tibetan Buddhist uh, monk or nun studies or has access to. Um, and it made its way to the West for the very first time in the early 90s and got translated into English and not just into English, but into a context that we could use and work with as lay people, as non-nuns and monks um, and has been taught and really is the center of the center of everything we do at Three Jewels since then. And so there are 18 courses uh, in the whole ACI curriculum and the course that we just finished is ACI 7 which is the Bodhisattva vows. And we're gonna go into what's a Bodhisattva, what are vows, I'm sure in a lot of detail tonight. But just quickly, so you have that context, you know, and, and start to think about it too, because we're gonna take questions real time, but what would it take to meet something, meet some sort of philosophy, get a taste for it, then have access to a studio or people that could give you practices to start to live that philosophy, and then get so excited that you, or, or and so passionate uh, that you would actually promise to practice, right? Take vows off of, on that basis. And so that's uh, really what we went over in this class, in the Bodhisattva vows class. And of course it begs the question, okay, what are you promising to do, right? What are these practices you're promising to do? And it's really to become a Bodhisattva, right? To become someone who is, frankly, obsessed with living their life for the sake of others, for finding uh, in every moment of everything they do a love that's founded on the wisdom of how things really work. And I can give you all sorts of definitions of bodhisattva, but I don't have to because we actually have one with us today. Um, I know so many of you already know and love him. You haven't yet located the shining square that is Hector Marcel. Um, he's here with us today and I invite you to think about not just the square but the powerful being behind or within that square and the life that he's lived. He's really not only moved his mind through all 18 of those ACIs but then actually taught us those courses and lived them as a, as a way of life for the last 20 years. Um, and I'm so excited that he's opening up his heart to share those stories with us tonight. Really grateful to have you here and to have your passion um, 
for the possibility of enlightenment and its availability for all of us. It, it just, it wouldn't exist the way it does for us without you. So thank you for being here. Um, and if you don't already know, you'll find out soon enough that Hector is not a monk. You know, he, he has the amazing boyfriend. He's also on this call. You know, he has the beautiful apartment. He has the flourishing businesses. But we're going to quickly find out, if you've talked to him for even a moment, you know this, that behind all those experiences, there's this vast inner world where the Dharma is really a rich and alive and, and turned on in his being. So it's amazing to have access to you uh, right now specifically, and, um, and, and thank you for everything you've given us. Let's jump in, actually, before we jump in, in lieu of sort of a formal motivation setting, we usually offer the mandala. I'll just invite everyone, wherever you are, before we dive in, this is going to be really conversational and interactive, but I'll ask you to connect to that part of your mind that wants every word that we exchange here tonight, every idea, every giggle, there's going to be a lot, I'm sure Hector's involved. Uh, but may it not just stay here with us on this Zoom call, right? May I hope it, it grows, it expands, it ripples out, and especially now, it really reaches anyone everywhere, those who are in mental and physical pain, those who are confused, curious, those who are searching for the Dharma, for the wisdom, and, and, may, and not even knowing that that's what they're looking for. So I hope that our exchange can go beyond just these little squares. Um, and with that motivation, let's jump in. So I wanna give plenty of time, a little structure for the evening. So a lot of the students who have been part of ACI 7 actually already submit questions. And that has helped us organize what's to come. It's gonna be sort of a four act um, show, if you will, right? And so we have sort of themes um, and questions grouped into that. And that'll hopefully provide some structure for tonight. And what we're gonna do at the end of each uh, sort of mini act, I'll open up, I mean, the chat is always open. So I'd say as we kind of progress through, send questions in. Uh, you can also at the end of each, I'll, I'll uh, unmute yourself and, and you can also kind of vocally engage. Yeah, does that make sense? So I do want it to be interactive, but we have plenty of questions to get started with. So I'm gonna stop talking now and this chat is already devolving, of course. Oh, I will say this one thing. If you want your question, you know, send it just to me privately so it can sort of be a surprise for, for everyone else, if you'd like. But we're gonna jump right in, Hector. Thank you again. Uh, this whole first section of questions that we got were really, why vows? Why promises, right? Why decide to practice in that way, to approach spirituality through that lens? And so the first question, we got many versions of this was sort of, when did you know that you were ready to take vows? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> uh, the, the, first of all, uh, you moved me to tears to all of you to see what Three Jewels has become virtually. Yeah. Um, it is my heart's desire to see the responsibility for transferring your world from suffering to bliss in each of everyone's hearts. And I know that's available in the stuff we engage together as community at Three Jewels, the Dharma that comes from ACI and in these contexts. But it moved me to tears to see so many familiar and beautiful faces because I've seen you work the Dharma. And by Dharma, I don't mean Buddhist, I mean your mind and kindnesses and wisdom and effort, yeah, and so, I'm so happy to be with all of you. Thank you. And I'm also excited that I didn't have to prepare a PowerPoint for the presentation <laughs> class, that I can actually very candidly share my experience and, and hopefully, uh, ho hopefully avoid a couple of years worth of effort by a few lines or moments that if they connect with you, you don't have to do the mistakes that I have done and some that I'm, I keep doing. So thank you. Now you have to remind me that first question. Yeah. <laughs> you have to remind me that first question now. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay. Um, so first question is, 
in your journey of meeting the Dharma, at what point did you feel ready to take on vows and why? Yeah, so that, that's a great start to the question because I wasn't ready ever. Yeah, not even when I took them. And initially when I was learning them, my mind latched onto that very seriously as it should. This is a massive, important thing, enlightenment. You know, a, a monastic, like thousands of years of people pouring their wisdom and their insights into this precious thing that I got, it was huge. And all my friends who were doing ACI with me for less time than me, they were just diving in, taking refuge vows, bodhisattva vows. Some of them were like, within three years, they got tantric vows. And I was freaking out. I'm like, I can't do that. My mind's garbage. If Sam there, my mind is a dumpster fire. Yeah. Fire. Yeah, dumpster fire. <laughs> so, and I felt not ready. So the first time a group of students in ACI at Three Jewels took refuge vows, I thought I, I couldn't, I would break them, I would fail. It was like, here we go, let's devolve the conversation straight away. It was like losing your virginity. I had, I had as a teenager, I'd played around sexually with all sorts of things, but I wouldn't lose my virginity. I wouldn't have sex with, unless it was love, unless she at the time was special. And I waited till I was 21 and all my friends laughed at me, but it was special. I wasn't going to do it until that one special thing. Yeah. And I did. I waited. She was 21. I was 21 and it was a mess. It was terrible. First time you have sex, don't do it. Right. Have it the second time. Um, but anyway, <laughs> body suffer vows in particular. So eventually I took refuge vows before moving back to Australia. And I wasn't ready, but I made a commitment to work hard at them. I took them very, very seriously. It was the most precious thing. And then with Bodhisattva vows, I chickened out in the last chance to take them at Three Jewels. And when I moved to Australia, uh, I, I realized I missed out. I sort of moved out to Australia by force. I missed out on these vows. And so I kept them beautifully like with complete effort but without the commitment of having to have the vow so i could fail every now and then you know so i had that little i, I didn't fail because i didn't take the vows and i would do it and it was 10 years of keeping those vows and within those 10 years i realized oh my goodness i could have taken them earlier because i want to take them i want to take them from my teacher and so when i when I moved back, I took them and some other vows as well, the tantric vows soon after. So you never are ready, yeah? But I think the thing that drove me to taking on that bigness that I created was uh, seeing life fail often around me. So I had two choices, refuge in, everything I see everyone else building, some of it nice shiny objects, careers, businesses, relationships, you know, self-esteem, cars, everyone's getting them, marriage, babies. Um, but all of them, if you look ahead a little bit, I could see old people that used to have relationships, old people that used to have businesses attached to what they had built in the business, in the relationship, in the children, suffering that the children are gone, suffering that the internet took over their business and there was no refuge. And so for me, it was like refuge there or do I gamble refuge here? So intellectually, I understood the promise. And so I just went for it. If I'm going to have this one life, because that's all I knew at the time, I'm making it count. If I fail at the end, it was not through not trying and not through I just want to try a different result because I could see the other result for everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I hope that answers the question. Doesn't freak everyone out. It, it actually leads us to, it, you, you sort of snuck it in there, but you said, so it sounds like, you know, you were alone in Australia for 10 years and you said, okay, I had this internal drive to keep my vows, mm -hmm. you know, and we talked about that in the course, like, what does it mean? You don't just, you don't just keep them in your pocket. What did that mean? Keeping your vows. And there's a, a lot of questions we got around, did laziness ever creep in? Did no. doubt ever creep in? And how did you work with that, especially far away from your community? Yeah. No, I never had a doubt in my life and uh, I kept them perfectly. Next question. 
Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, we walked into that. <laughs> yeah, no, just uh, that, I, that was easy. Yeah. No, of course you have doubt all the time. I mean, and if once you start studying all the detail cr information that all the pandits and teachers from the past leave behind, you'll know that the mental affliction of doubt, that state of mind which doubts, does not leave until you have this direct perception of reality, until you have the direct perception of emptiness, doubt is always there. And so I had doubts about the career too. And so this was a, a thing that kept me keeping the vows. I often went back to, okay, what's my default? What's my option? Yeah, of course I have doubts. These, some of these vows are weird. Yeah. So then, and then I had the whole Catholic problem where vows meant I had to be Catholic again. And that was weird. You know, I didn't want to be Catholic. I, I, I left that when I was a child and it had negative implications at the time for me, not anymore. Yeah. And so keeping the vows took me a long time to understand what that meant. Often I got rigid around getting the rule just right. Oh my God, I failed. And sometimes in, in that decade, I, sometimes I cornered myself over months of looking at my vows to get my mind to depression, self-hatred and negativity. Often I used the vows, which are just printed words on a sheet before our phones. And I used them not to do what the vow is supposed to do, which is check the state of your mind right now, just do a check. Where is it leaning here or there? Are you creating more virtue? Instead of looking and investigating and actively trying to understand it like one should, I was like, oh my God, you're just a terrible person. You'll fail. You'll never get enlightened. You're an asshole. You, you know, you'll, you'll be suffering for the rest of your life. You, not only that, you destroy Dharma. Like, you know, like I let my mind create what the mind was going to create without Buddhism, without, without wake upism. And it took me months to wake up to that pattern. And so keeping the vows for me was trial and error, failing often until you got the pliancy to know that it's supposed to be a tool. It's supposed to be a tool to make your mind better, really. It's supposed to remove the afflictions. It's supposed to generate love and compassion with wisdom. And if it's not doing that, you're doing it wrong. And doing it wrong is great for the samsaric mind. The, the me that was before Dharma loves it when Hector gets it wrong. You know, and for decade, it was, it, it had a grip, samsaric mind, suffering, unattended, unquestionable, identity had a beautiful new tool to make me feel like shit. Yeah. And it wasn't until I realized that there's a pattern over those 10 years that it's like we orbit an idea and we often move through that orbit, sometimes feeling great and sometimes feeling, and this orbit wasn't the vow. It was the way you see yourself. And the vow is just a reflection. The engagement to the vow is just a reflection. So the, the one little trick that I used to get me out of, and I, I fell into sort of depression to the point of getting meds at one point, you know, and it wasn't because of the vows, but it was in general. I mean, I was practicing. Um, the trick that got me out of realizing I was just being too tight or literal and I was missing the point of the vow was um, using the state of mind of the samsaric mind, which wants checks and balances against itself so i'd go back to the vow the way i studied it the definition from sonkapa or whoever had made the commentary and you know you need to do the four chains to break these vows right it's hard for most of them nearly all of them so i'd sit there and look at my six times book look at the vow and if i didn't break it not if i came close not if if I didn't break, I get a huge tick, right? Like, like a massive tick. I won that bow today. And I just keep 
acknowledging positive reinforcement about that bow. I wouldn't look at what I did wrong. Yeah, I, I just look at what I did great. And I did that for a few months and my mind shifted gradually. And that was a good trick. It really helped me say, okay, get real about it. You're just using this as an excuse to let the old state of mind come and take over the state of mind that is supposed to transform you. And, and our minds are tricky, right? The inertia of normal is, is following you in Buddhist Dharma, in the moon. It'll follow you everywhere in your sleep. It'll come in your dreams, knock, knock. You're normal. Somehow you're broken. You're terrible at this. You're horrible at that. It's coming. And the point of these vows is a kind of refuge. It's a kind of sanctuary where you get to experiment some different identity growing. Uh, and it took me a decade or more, really, until I got some pliancy. And now I'm perfect. No. And, you know, like, <laughs> I'm not. But the, the thing is called practice. The thing is called practice. So chill. Like, but don't chill so much that you're just back to normal. Make efforts, but chill. Yeah, that's my summary. Make efforts, yeah. but chill. Yeah, no, you, you mentioned some of the sources that you go back to, right? When you're looking for reminders about the details of the vow, you mentioned Jason Kappa or other commentaries. And so we got a question, why, why vows in this tradition? You know, why vowed morality in this container? You mentioned Catholicism, like were you attracted to a vowed way of life in sort of any other sense? Did you compare between different traditions? Like what was it about this system? I didn't want to do vows, that was too much commitment. You know, um, why vows? No, why vows in this tradition was the question, right? Okay, so here's my, um, I, I realized lately, I've been thinking about it often, but it's one of those orbit things. If it were not for Joseph Campbell in one, that. yeah, if it wasn't for him in one line of an interview on the second, episode of the power of myth the interview with bill moyers on comparative religion yeah i was just watching that because i was interested in storytelling i was going to be a script writer i was going to write movies yeah so i was going to get stories from joseph campbell that's how i landed there and then i was very fascinated in comparative religion joseph uh, carl jung's uh, ideas and then there was this one moment that really the, the reason I'm sitting here begins in my mind with that moment. Obviously, it came before. But he, he said something like, you know, I study all sorts of mythologies and religions. I know the stories over here and over here and over here. And he mentioned, you know, all of them. And then he said something like, but I'll never have an experience like that of a saint because I haven't gone down one particular maze of one of these traditions in depth. And it could have been a throwaway line, but my mind got obsessed with thinking, this dude, the foremost authority of comparative religion, the mythology that lets you deal with the human condition, he's not just talking academics now. He's not just saying this story has these steps. He's saying he can ha he believes he can have an experience like that of a saint. And to me, that's a Mother Teresa, a Gandhi, and all the mythological figures in those stories. Is that's he in my experience of that, that opened up the possibility that all of us have the capacity to experience our world like that of a saint, to look upon. New York City and not see the rats as terrible <laughs> and to go oh look at all these wonderful hairy creatures that are here as well and mean it yeah <laughs> and they're eating those triangles with the red circles nice <laughs> so I don't know if a saint would see the rats eating pizza like that in the subway but in my mind that I couldn't get that out of my mind day in, day out, day in, day out. I'm like, he believes we don't have to have a normal, boring, picket fence, life ends terrible existence. 
he thinks something else is possible. I want to know what that is. That's worth chasing. Yeah. And that just lit a fire under my ass. I went to NYU. I took comparative religion class. And as soon as that happened, and you've all had this, if you've, if you're here and had a Dharma connection, you've all had some magic appear in your life that week, that month, a bunch of serendipitous experiences came that brought me to three jewels on opening night. And, and so I didn't care for the vows. I didn't care for meeting three jewels. I didn't like meeting Geshe Michael, my holy teacher. I didn't like all the restrictions, but I had Joseph Campbell in my head going, if you don't follow just one thing, then you, you, can't have that experience of a say you're just going to be this know-it-all about look at this mythology isn't that nice to breathe like that isn't it good to look this pink over here and pink over there duh i wanted rapture you know and so for me and then i got it right i got a tibetan buddhist galupa tradition which is list after list after list after list after an innumerable number of requirements to get to enlightenment <laughs> but so rich and a map, a detailed map all the way, very clear from schmuckness to awakening. And so I got what I wanted. Then I had to do it. And it, one of the parts was take a vow without a promise, without turning on body cheetah. You can't have, you can't have the experience like that of a saint. And so yeah, okay, it took me 10 years to get into the Bodhisattva vows, but I'm on it still. Thank you, Joseph Campbell. Mm. I hope that that resonates and why this tradition, you know, I don't have to like it. I just got to know it works, right? You don't have to like the medicine. You just got to intellectually understand its consequences and then constantly remind yourself what's the option. You know, what, what's your option? I want rapture. Uh, if it's possible here, I want it. I know what everything else looks like. I saw my mom in, on her deathbed in, with cancer. That's where this body is going. The mind doesn't have to. Yeah. The mind can have a different experience of that. It, that I understand clearly. If it were not for Joseph Campbell. Yeah. I hope that answers, <laughs> I hope so too. Yeah, no, I mean, so you've chosen this medicine and uh, this is related to a question that just came in, but this rapture you're talking about, this sainthood, can you talk about what that has to do with emptiness, specifically this experience of emptiness you talked about? We got a question, what, what does that mean, the connection between until you learned about emptiness, of course you had some sort of doubt? Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, if, until you see emptiness directly, the books say you, you'll you have doubt, yeah? And you can remove a big chunk of that doubt by understanding emptiness intellectually, yeah? And, and look, I don't, I really keep saying it, I don't want people to become Buddhists that are dogmatic. I don't want people to become Buddhists because Buddhists know the answer. Buddha don't own your mind, you know, not the not the religious thing you think Buddha is that that's not what we're talking about here. And so the rapture that I'm talking about is that connection, that brightness, that possibility in your mind. And that possibility is only available if you understand that your mind, the way it is now is only because it was caused that way. Something produced the experience in your mind and therefore in your reality. And it keeps changing and it changes because it doesn't have a nature. It's empty of a nature. If it was a depressive mind, you would not not be depressed. If, it, if by nature your mind was Hector, you would never not be Hector in the way you think of yourself. So the mind, sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad, sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Sometimes you feel sexy, sometimes don't touch me, right? So why is your mind doing that? It's not one thing. It's a changing, moving thing. Yeah, you look at ice cream, you get bliss. You have two buckets of ice cream, you feel vomitous. It, it doesn't, that nature isn't in the ice cream. Your experience of that also isn't the way you think you are. So because of emptiness, because you don't have 
a nature that is fixed, you are, you are available to be reflecting or be whatever is forced upon you by your mind's previous actions, the seeds that were planted there before. And so understanding that is vital. And that's why I think it's a blessing to understand the Buddhist philosophy through the lens of the Majjhimika Prasangika school. Once you study, you know what that means. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. It just means things don't have a nature from their own side, emptiness. And there's ways you can understand that. But understand that it's a, if it doesn't have a nature, it's available to be anything that is observed, you know, that is experienced. And that's dependent on the observer, not on the thing. And your mind is one of those things. Your awareness of yourself is one of those things. It doesn't have a nature. So when you're feeling a depressive person, when you're feeling that's forced upon the emptiness of your mind. And that's really what Buddha nature means. It means all of us have, it's one of the things we go to refuge for. It, it's one of the vows <laughs> to go to refuge to that idea. It's one of the refuge vows, right? Go to refuge to the idea that whatever you think you are, a hundred percent, it will change. But the change isn't random. It's only random because you don't know how you put it there. The change is produced by what you put in that mind before. And then it will be forced upon you as an experience of self and identity. So then if you understand that mechanic, all of a sudden, all of these weird bullshit spiritual practices make sense until then they don't make sense why be kind to people take care of yourself it's fine that's a weird practice take care of someone else but if you understand that taking care of someone else plants the seeds of being cared for then all of a sudden taking care of self of others means you will be taken care of teaching someone your knowledge means someone will show you their knowledge cause and effect the results bigger than the cause yeah like having compassion for someone means when you're down you will experience being lifted up all of a sudden that practice ain't so weird yeah meditation weird thing for humans to do what animals or cats maybe sit there and go, okay, right now I'm just going to sit like this. Weird. Unless you're doing microsurgery to the very thing that creates all of your reality, your entire experience, both of self and other. So I don't even remember the question you just asked, but that's the answer. <laughs> Another thing in the list of weird that, that came up. So I'd love your commentary on it, but I think a concept that a lot of us feel almost like viscerally allergic to before you're presented with some sort of logical proof or something, you've cooked it in your mind or on your cushion. But it's, uh, and, and you mentioned, you know, okay, at one point for you, you were like, let me get the most out of this life, right? That I have to work with. But then you've also been talking about these karmas, these movements of mind uh, as this unstoppable stream, right? Beginningless, endless. And so an implication of anyone who's considering taking vows or studying vows is that it's not just in this life that you're going to feel the effects, but actually in future lives as well. And you're taking these promises with that understanding. So a lot of questions about, uh, was it hard for you to believe in this idea of future lives? Um, what, does that have to, what does that have to do with your, your practice as it looks now? Yeah, I mean, it took some work. It took some convincing. It, it wasn't something I... I had as the default. I thought it was hokey pokey, weird, one of those Eastern things. So, but you know, I, I had such an anchor. I, I, the promise of rapture was really worth the effort for me. So Geshe Michael would often say to me, if you have doubts, put them on the shelf. And that was one of the things on the shelf. That shelf, in fact, was so heavy, it fell over one day and everything, you know, fell apart. And then I had to reconsider my commitment to my own life and everything, you know. But I just put it on the shelf when it was too much. I don't have to. And I didn't have to believe it. I don't believe it, you know, at, back then. I Logically, it is so much clearer to me now than it, than it ever was. I cannot think of... I cannot... Th Think of one life 
standalone, independent, without a consequence after. Like, you know, like I, especially after you get this really awesome org chart in, I think, one of the ACI courses, I think, is it ACI 14? No, 13? Is it 13? The, Which org chart? There's so the many. Org chart of the everything. The, what, you know, you've got Takpa, Mi Takpa, you've got everything. But the oh. Buddhists are amazing. There's this org chart of absolutely everything That's cool. that exists. And you can divide that into changing things and unchanging things. So now there's two divisions out of everything that exists. And the unchanging things are emptiness, empty space, etc. And the changing things are either physical or mental or some conception in between. And so once you got there and understood it, you're like, of course, this will change. It changes all the time. This used to be a five-year-old boy's hand. It don't look like that. Look how weird it looks now for a five-year-old. If I'm a five-year-old looking at it, it's weird. And the mind has changed. I definitely don't have the same impulses I had. There seems to be a continuum of an impulse that I call Hector. But in fact, it's not true. I was Marcelo until I was 10. You know, Marcelo. You, you call me Marcelo, I'd turn around. You call me Hector when I was 10, I wouldn't turn around. And so that's not even true either. The identity of who I am that way. It appears that way because we're there all the time witnessing. But this mind is nothing like the mind when I was five or 10 and so on. And so if this will change into other physical things. No atom will be spared. It will become other things. Same for mind. It makes logical sense. <coughs> it, it, makes, it makes more sense than you disappear or somehow your body is your mind. Once I understood, no, the mind has a very different nature. Yeah, it's, it's fluid. It's, you can't grab it. It's fast. You know, once you study, and that's what's vital and, and amazing about the 18 courses together, it's a shame it takes seven years. But when you start getting that chunk of information and you let that cook, as you get that chunk of information and you let that cook, it begins to form this 3D picture of what we are and what we're swimming in that is so vastly different to what I thought we were in. I used to think we were walking on a real planet out there that is separate to my conception of it and i am stuck with the entire experience now my mind is the world we're living in my mind is my conception of each of your questions and your thoughts i'm in that sense i'm you and you are me in that sense there is this interdependence and it has a very different meaning in this context than I used to think before I studied the, the entire ACI curriculum. And not just studied it, but really questioned it. Like I, the first two years of me studying this was me wanting to break it. I wanted to prove it wrong. And I think that was healthy. Now that planted some karmas that I had to eat later, but the attitude was good. Yeah, like the, the impulse was, I just really want to check it out. And if I couldn't work, if I was 50-50, it goes on the shelf. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, I'll see if there's a different practice. But I haven't really had too much of that. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered so, some of that. It did. But, and I think it, oh, sorry. So now, of course, this mind continues. It's ridiculous in my mind to think that, okay, the body stopped, it stopped. You know, and there's that. Proof of Future Lives course, right? It's really... ACI4. ACI4. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and your answer makes it so clear that when you're talking about mind, you're not talking about brain or the way we sort of conceive of it in the West. It's this much more expansive experience of consciousness. And I think that brings us to the last question of sort of this first act of why vows, which is really in your, in your struggle against them and then embracing them when did they not become this intellectual brainy thing of, oh, here's the list. Here's me understanding them. And what can you give us a glimpse into what does it feel like to embody and practice these vows? Uh, the, the real question is, what does compassion feel like for you, that experience? Uh, 
Uh, I don't know how to answer that question. When I, when I failed enough times that I saw, when I talked about it at the beginning, where my mind was just using the vows as an excuse to go back and revert to the self-existent Hector that was sad. You know, when I saw my mind do that, I sort of got fed up with it. I'm like, no, you're not, this is not your real estate. So I got serious about transformation. And you, I think you have to have a couple of those rock bottom moments to, to say, are you real? Oh, I thought I was real before. No, are you real, real about this? Do you really want that rapture? Or is it just nice you're cruising something now? Because it will take work. And so you can't become something else without deconstructing something that was unhelpful. And so for me, you know, for years I tried to be compassionate by being nice. And some of you know I'm not that nice all the time. Right, Stephen? <laughs> so I don't think nice is compassionate. I think sometimes nice can be enabling. And it's a nice cop-out because then I don't have to confront you. Yeah. And so for me, when, when one of those rock bottom moments where I realized, hold on, you, you haven't used these vows for the energy and power that will get you that trajectory, get real again. So then, you know, that doesn't happen because I decided it's another habit. You have to take time and fail and get up and fail and get up. So that takes weeks and months. But once you get that commitment, you get a little fire under your ass and you, and you start engaging with the vows again. And so compassion became broader than being nice when I realized that I had to have some hard conversations with partners or friends or myself and say, just letting you go by and let things happen is not kindness. Kindness is letting you stay in suffering mode, samsara in negative habits that I see you and me going in. That's, not compassion. Letting that go on is not compassion. And if I have to turn serious or wrathful to change that, that's compassion. And so for me, it was a stretch to do that. I want to be nice because I want you to like me. I don't want to be mean. But mean wasn't compassion. Sorry, but, but being nice wasn't compassionate. Yeah. In some instances, it was like vomitous to try and have that hard conversation. You know, and one of my exes, I remember it very clearly. You, like I was in knots in my stomach, but the conversation had to be had. If I let you continue this way, we and you will suffer for way more than this little lapse of time. We're quickly running downhill in a downward spiral and letting it break apart by itself isn't compassion. And so for me, compassion is having that gut-wrenching necessity to get people and myself to wake up in interactions. I mean, so many of the questions you've asked today are really about us having a conception of what practice and what reality is. About breaking those misconceptions. Because we think vows are a certain thing. That's what vows are. <laughs> vows are this beautiful gift of the map to rapture that say, if you turn this on and you turn this down and you turn this up and you turn this down, naturally you will create the courses in your mind for rapture to arise. And, and we just don't think of it that way. We think vows are restrictive, get the whip and you know, like, so we have a misconception and so much of this discussion and my experience of turning these vows into an inner world, were about letting go and removing and being aware that I had a misunderstanding about what a vow is and all the content of that, what emptiness is, what karma is, what happens to the mind, the division between mind and body. So that's why study is vital, but not studied so you can become Buddhists. That would be the worst thing you could do. Be really good Buddhists that know all the Buddhist stuff and not transform because you haven't turned it on. That would be the worst. Yeah, you've, you've uh, fast forwarded us into act two of it, which are a couple more nitty gritty questions about actually practicing the vows. And, and a couple of things came up like, did you have to pick favorites ever? Like picking, you know, favorites between your children 
is the way I think about it. But questions around, well, and I think you sort of got to this. Did you, did you memorize the vows? How, do you have your mouths memorized? How important do you think that is? No. I feel like you, you've touched on that and answered it. But I'd say if you had to, if the answer is no, what's the most essential one? What's the one they all boil down to? Yeah, so, so look, I'm, I'll tell you about my seventh grade teacher in school, um, math teacher. And he's, we never met him before. He was a new teacher and he's, and nobody likes math, right? Like who likes math? Leave. No, um, we didn't anyway. And so we're just dreading this new teacher who's going to try and convince us to do math. And his opening line was, okay, I'm going to be honest with you. Math is the, for the laziest person around. If you're really, really lazy, you'll be really good at math because you've got to look for the quickest, simplest solution to a problem. And the only way you get there is if you're really lazy and you look for the shortcut. And I'm like, that's me. I like shortcuts. And so I, <laughs> he made me into someone interested in math from that thing. I applied the same shortcut cheating method to the vows, which for me meant this vows isn't separate these vows are not separate from my entire world. So if I get into the habit of keeping promises, if I get into the habit of keeping promises everywhere, then they'll naturally, I'll naturally keep these vows. So it's not a vow, but it's a promise to keep my promise. So from that, I thought, thanks to that math teacher, that's the easiest shortcut to keep the vows. Keep every promise. From now on, don't break promises. And don't promise what you can't deliver. And I became obsessed at that in my 20s. We had a meeting to go. This is before iPhones. This is before calendars, okay? If I had to meet you at 8 o'clock in Times Square, I'd be there at 7.45. I'd be early. So we are meeting at 8 o'clock. Yeah. If I was supposed to send you the gift i'll send you the gift keep your promise became the number one vow that helped me keep all these other things and i mean the theory was it would translate over in reality i've failed at these vows so much that i know now what my mind wants to do to to fail them again you know so it's I, these vows are just an intimate relationship with qualities in your mind that will get you to rapture you know and if you if you keep the study of cause and effect, karma and emptiness, karma and emptiness, you could deduce intellectually how each of these vows can deliver a certain aspect of that rapture. And so for me, the main, the, the, the keeping the vows was vital. And so all of you know, if you want to meet with me, send me a calendar request because I don't want to break my vow. I don't want to break my promise. Yeah. So if it's not my calendar, I'll break my promise. Then I have to do the four forces. Boring. You know, so I'd rather not do the four forces to purify the vow I broke or the promise I broke. I'd rather you send me a calendar request. Yeah. So that's one thing. Then the overall, the overarching is the, the idea of the pen. Memorize that. Never forget that. That is the essence of the pen things don't have a nature they're empty of a nature this could be a chew toy this could be a pen it's dependent on the seed that's forced upon you by your past actions so every action counts nothing is uncounted every kindness will produce kindness every suffering will produce suffering bitter fruit the bitter seed bitter result sweet seed sweet result and so every movement of my mind, every word out of my mouth, if it doesn't have the motivation, the karmic pill inside that I want you to find your rapture, if I'm just talking because I want to be a famous TikToker or I just want to be special or something, then I'm going to get exactly what my intention, the source of the seed is. But if I genuinely am telling you these words, because I am looking at your faces and I'm hoping that whatever the mask of normal is taking over you, it gets ripped off and in its place, you have your rapture enlightened face, then the words don't really matter, right? I'm going to do my best to tell you the 
remember the karma and emptiness thing, which is refuge. Pen is refuge. Refuge means protection, protection from normal. Remembering that you are like this, empty of a nature, and you could be divine, just like sometimes you're depressed and sometimes you're happy. We're, 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 we're satisfied to operate in this little bullshit realm of, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm a little depressed, I'm a little happy. The, the band is way bigger. The capacity is way bigger. And yet, where the human incarnate things with minds projecting our reality, karma and emptiness, and we're happy to play here. Get, get the picket fence, get two dogs, get three children, get two children, get a career. You're dead. You know, and yet there was opportunity to create, create rapture in an infinitely, like your mind is infinite. Why not seed the bloody hell out of all of it with the deepest kindness, most powerful intention? That's what I, that's my lottery. Yeah, that's, thank you, Joseph Campbell. That's my, you're dead. <laughs> Hashtag you're dead. Sorry, Jane. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah, that's, that's. Best vow is the refuge vow of not taking refuge in worldly objects. It's the no wrong views. It's karma and emptiness. The, the best vow is remembering that things don't have a nature because then every engagement with every vow can turn on that vow. Mm. And let's say you, you, uh, I'll see if I can get to the question through this, but let's say you, you, have an escape route, you get out, you have a desert island, a refuge island, rapture island, whatever you want to call it, that you, you get to go with too. Uh, uh, the question yeah. that came is, you can only bring one thing with you. Would you bring your vow practice or your meditation practice? Okay, uh, two answers to that, okay? I'd bring Stephen because you need your deepest affliction. No, no, no. <laughs> There's not a choice in this question. <laughs> That was just for Stephen. <laughs> you, if you do, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> One vow. I, I would take the first refuge vow. Really, yeah. I would take the first refuge vow. I wouldn't even take a bodhisattva vow, because not taking refuge in worldly objects would naturally lead you to planting the courses for your enlightenment. It will naturally do so when you realize over and over and over things don't have a nature. It's the foundation of everything. When you realize nothing has a nature, then it changes your behavior and all the other vows are about. So all the refuge vows are stop being a shithead. Stop harming things. Don't kill. Don't steal. They're like all the refuge and the 10 non virtues are, there are courses for your suffering and you're planting them every day. Stop it. Yeah. So that's the refuge and the pratimoksha vows. Then the bodhisattva vows are more about, okay, now be awesome. Now plant the roses. Now take care of everyone. Now give every, like create your garden. The other one is stop planting weeds. Bodhisattva vows are create your garden. Tantric vows are sprinkle magic fertilizer on everything and watch what you thought were going to be roses become these most incredible intertwined magic forests. Yeah. But that's another story. <laughs> so for me, the refuge vow of not taking refuge in worldly objects, which is, I think the first one, right? It, it leads to everything else. It's the foundation for everything else. It must, if you believe that, if you practice that, if you turn that on, you will be kind to every ant on that deserted island. You would build perfect safety places for every ant and feed them. You know, if everything is your projection and it only appears the way you're acting, then every act would be for the benefit of others, which is all the body of else. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered. The, I think the other thing that I didn't mention that I wanted to, no, I didn't memorize them. It was so frustrating because when you start studying these things, there's lists upon lists and more study and it feels overwhelming. And so for me, I just created a cheat sheet. I've got that document, which I shared with you. I don't know if you shared it with others, which is 
I just grab commentaries from books, all my teacher's notes about each of the vows, the best I could find. And I have it on my phone. And if I don't remember the flavor, I go check. And then I'll, I'll check it and go, oh, that's what the way I'm supposed to be thinking about it. Whereas before I, and, and look, it's not going to come because you decide it's not going to come tomorrow. It takes time. And I made that long-term commitment to Joseph Campbell. I want rapture. I want an experience like that of a saint. I'd rather spend my life there. And there's two dangers to that, right? You can really come up to a wall and then ah, give up. Or, and if you don't have the long goal of rapture, you're going to give up. Or, as it's happened to me a few times, you might meet with bliss along the way and abundance and joy. And you might get uh, seduced to thinking, oh, I'm going to sit in this nice samsaric paradise and enjoy the beautiful thing I've just built and forget that the lure of rapture is around the corner. You're like, I'm just going to enjoy this nice time. I'm not saying don't enjoy it, but do not let the attachment grips get you hold of you so you don't have to practice so hard. Mm. Yeah. So th those are the two things along the way. It's cool. I think, I mean, hopefully that gets at a question I just got, but maybe if you could speak a little bit more, uh, they're asking, so, okay, with, with the shitty stuff, with the annoying boyfriend, the angry boss, the boring pen, cool. I want to see those things as empty of a nature from their own side. And they're totally up for transformation through what I do. But what about the good stuff? What about those moments of bliss? What about those touches of rapture? How do you work with the truth that those two are lacking in nature from their own side? Yeah, I know. I remember that feeling of being really depressed that the good things are also impermanent. Oh. You know, I didn't want that to be true. I just wanted them to be there all the time, which is going to guarantee suffering. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so the tiny moments of rapture, the tiny moments of bliss and beauty that we sense and experience often, and more and more, the more you practice, right? You want to keep them going. That's what rapture is. It's that state of mind perpetually. Yeah. And it ain't going to stay there if you have attachment towards it. Yeah, If you have attachment towards it, meaning you have a sense of a worldly attachment that it has a nature of niceness, it doesn't mean it's not nice. It's nice because your mind is protect, projecting nice on its empty nature. You want your mind to project more nice and not just on that, but on that. And not just for now, but for later. So you want to find out what generated that goodness and you want to amplify that so it keeps showing up. And it won't show up in the same way, not here, right? But the flavor from your mind will show up the same way. When you see this and you see that, you'll see this bliss arise in both these things until this bliss arises for all things. And, and I've had experiences where previously this was shitty and this was nice and I was only liking that and not liking that. And then eventually the shortcut to keeping those going because that's what you want to do but not with attachment thinking it's self-existent is give it the bloody hell away for the tiny window that you have it think of others for the tiny window that you're making out with that new boyfriend or your whatever the goodness you're feeling is that is ah oh, blissful think of others while you're kissing your boyfriend that's a bad message that i like, think <laughs> Not like that, in a Dharma sense. Be Buddhist about it and think of others while you're kissing your boyfriend. <laughs> what I mean is, Stephen's like <laughs> upset. <laughs> but <laughs> quote of the day. <laughs> what I'm saying is, um, without getting sad, Think how many people would love to not feel lonely today and how fortunate I am to have this intimate moment with this person and how magic it is that I can feel this magic moment just with lips touching with another being. Yeah, just a second, a second of contact gives me rapture. There's some rapture. I wish everyone else had it too. Everyone that's lonely, everyone that, I mean... <laughs> 
everyone that thinks they no longer want love, you know, can they just have it now? Can you imagine it somehow? Can you imagine it in your dreams? Can you dedicate it that evening? Whatever it is, find that rapture, the goodness that's arising. It's dependent arising. It's arising dependent on your projections, on the karmas you are. You want to keep that going? Give it away quickly. Give it away quickly, like earnestly, not with self-interest, just earnestly. Think of anyone that's suffering some loneliness, anyone that's suffering broken heartedness, anyone whose relationships breaking and they don't know how to fix it. Send that rapture to them and may they see their partner that way for a second. And that be selfless about it completely. And that keeps those things going. You got a little bit of money, give it away. Not all of it. You enjoy what you have to enjoy, but, at the bare minimum, give it away mentally. Wish other people could find this joy you just noticed when your bank account got the Donald Trump check. <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever. Like, don't just deposit the Donald Trump check. Dedicate it to all the people who wish they got a Donald Trump check who are living in India. Who are, you know, like, imagine coronavirus in India. You know, Im imagine that. Imagine it in some other country where there isn't health care. Imagine them getting some help. So give it away in a very practical, real sense in your mind and within your capacity. And that's what the vows mean. So, of course, you want to keep all the goodness. You want to keep all the tiny moments of raptures are just small windows of what your mind is capable of. And the more you give it away, those windows become doorways and then it's a whole renovation and there's no like it's a whole bifold doors french doors opening to rapture until there's no more need for a house you know and and then everything is rapture but it's a gradual progressive path into that mm -hmm. um i think that's my answer did i pass <laughs> i feel like i'm on jeopardy <laughs> So it right? actually, no, it, it's perfect. Actually, it brings us to last question of sort of this uh, second act. Um, before you perfected the art of thinking of others while you made out with your boyfriend, right? There's a vow. Uh, it's a bodhisattva vow. So it's like the way you mentioned that. Okay, of the mo of the most important of all the refuge vows is that first one. Don't take refuge in worldly objects. I'd uh, I'd assume you'd argue for bodhisattva vows, it's those all important root vow number nine and 18. Nine and 18, yeah. Right, don't, don't forget the promise you made to try to develop bodhicitta, this thinking of all others in every action, uh, and, and don't lose correct view. Don't fall into the mistake of thinking things are empty. So we, when we went over these vows in this class, we obviously spend a lot of time on them because they can be broken without the four chains present right? Fancy words, but essentially meaning it, it's not, it, it sounds like it's not very hard to break them, especially because yeah. it's so hard to hold those in your mind all the time. So yeah. practical question, how do you work specifically with those two vows and not just think that you're breaking them all the time? Look, at some you point you're going to think you're breaking them all the time. I had fear around those vows. So first of all, remember the point of these vows is not to instill fear. So that's, a weird experience that I'm having about these vows already. There's some kind of self existence here, you know, so I, I give you my quick, uh, my cheat. Thanks to my math teacher about 18. Yeah. Giving out the bodhisattva ideal. Yeah. So the definition of bodhisattva ideal is the wish for enlightenment for the sake of every living being. Yeah. And whatever garbage you're doing, to make sure you're happy. You're one of every living being. I know I'm rationalizing, but that's how I got through it. I'm like, I didn't give up the ideal. I'm still one of the people I'm trying to help. If I can help me, I can help others. Okay. I didn't break the vow. Do you see what I mean? So long as whatever you did was to benefit you too. It's a good, you're good. Didn't break it. So yeah, I know the four chains and whatever. And eventually you will get this sustained love for everyone, but maybe you don't have it initially. So I have this mentality that the entire vow system is the thing that I'm trying to develop. It's a check-in. It's a tool to check into rapture. Yeah. 
It's a tool to check into rapture. If my mind is practically and really using that vow to improve, good, then get nervous that you're coming close. But if it's just going to use it as an excuse to keep you normal, self-judging and negative and down on yourself, I'm not listening to it. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll break it, but I'm making efforts and all the other vows anyway. Thank you very much. And the same for the other wrong view. For the wrong view vow, I because it said, you know, um, not believe, the examples are not believing in past and future lives and the laws of karma, right? I think that's for vow nine. So cause and effect never fail, the laws of karma. Yeah. You it's hard to break that. It's really hard to break that because whatever shit you did, you thought you were going to get a result. So you do think that there's a result. You just have ignorance about the result. I had ignorance before I took the vows. I have ignorance whilst I develop the vows. The vows don't make you perfect when you take them. They perfect you as you play with them. So again, I, I didn't have that vow broken. <laughs> They were just examples. I did think that there was going to be a result. I was just wrong about the result. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. they're, they're my cheats for not getting despair in that one commentary line that says you don't need the four chains to break these two. You need an instant moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do I ever have an instant moment where I don't think something else is going to happen the next minute? No, I always think something else is going to happen. So I, I don't really break that vow. Now, that's probably scripturally incorrect. The same with the vow 18, but it saved me from getting obsessive compulsive with one negative corner of my mind that would have me believe I'm going to hell because I'm trying to get enlightened. Weird mind. Like, let's self-flatulate in this one tiny corner of this entire process. Why would your mind want to do that? Because it wants to stay normal. It doesn't want samsara to end. Very comfortable here, even though it hurts. Very comfortable. It's an abusive relationship. You can't leave. <laughs> These vows let you get out. I don't know if that helped. There's some serious faces. Is that too heavy for some? Kelly smiling again. Thank you. So is Tanya. Thank you. Hey, Kermie. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Oh, Suzanne, nice to see you. And Lan, I, all of you. Wow. So many chats. Thank you. There's so many, yeah. Thank I, you. That, so, I mean, that, our, our first half was sort of devoted to like more specific vow questions, but I'm excited to, to transition into a lot of questions about sort of, okay, you, you had this strong internal practice and whatever form it took as it evolved, how did you take it into the world? It, that there's going to be a whole series of questions on that. And then finally, a couple of really beautiful questions on your own personal practice, as much as you can share there. So yeah. first question about taking it into the world. Um, how did you take it? How did you keep this practice in a way that felt, uh, what's the word, like true to you with integrity um, and, and not hide it from people, you know, or not, shove it on people who maybe didn't have that own practice for themselves. So did you, were you a closeted Buddhist? Were you at, like, were you out? But what was that journey like? It was exactly like being gay as a South American kid in Australia. I was closeted. Even after I realized I was gay, I was closeted at work until my thirties. Nobody knew everyone was questioning why did Hector not bring his wife to the executive meeting? You know, because my wife had a beard. Um, so the, <laughs> that's, I was that way about Buddhism as well. And it was because of my previous beliefs. Like I was very disappointed with Catholicism. That I, I was very upset that you could go to church on Sunday, pretend to be nice to everyone and be a total shithead the rest of the week in the way that I experienced in people in South America and the incongruency between your inner world and your outer world was very apparent. 
And so may, many of you know, I sort of renounced all religion is evil and wrong in my 20s or in my teenage years. And then in my 20s, I took up the, the, <laughs> I took up the chalice of Anne Rand, the savior of all humanity and her philosophy, which is so harsh, <laughs> but her logic was clear, clean, precise. She just came to the wrong conclusion. I think now, but in my twenties, she was perfect. And for those of you that don't know this, if you don't know Anne Rand, she wrote the fountainhead. I read every single one of her books and I took that as the way I was going to structure my life. Cause it was on logic and reasoning and facts. None of these weird spiritual hippie bullshit. Yeah. So that's me in my twenties before meeting three jewels. So her philosophy, for those of you that don't know, and I love Anne Rand too, her logic is clear, but she came to the wrong conclusion. Her logic was the top of the food chain, the people we should aspire towards, the people that are worthy of everything on this planet are the producers, the industrialists, the people that come up with ideas like the railway and how to build buildings and the people that are actually creating the place for us to live on tier one, very few people. They are amazing. Zoom. Yeah. Then the second tier is most of us. And she called them leeches <laughs> because we suck on the goodness of all those lovely creative industrialists who produce the railways that we use that create the buildings that we live in. And so we only get benefit from their benevolence. And so we work for them and we leech money out of them. So that's the majority of people. This is her philosophy, not mine. Okay. But I, I was like, I'm going to put that into practice. I need, I'm a leech. I need to be an industrialist. I need to create my own business. <laughs> then there's two tiers below that in her way of thinking worse than the leeches. And she calls them the brutes, I think. And these are the military, the police, the people that use things by force to get what the leeches have or what the producers have. Does that make sense? So they, by gunpoint with war, they take like a honey badger, they take what they want. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then worst of all, worse than even the military, the police, the leeches is what she called the witch doctors which is all the religious people in the world <laughs> because they woo woo people's minds and they influence the industrialists to give them stuff. Yeah. They, they lean on the gun bearing people to use the gun and point it at the poor industrialists who created all our opportunity in the first place. So anyway, you have to think that in my mind, I took refuge in that Christianity, religion was the bottom of the food chain. Yeah. I, I'm not that anymore. I'm definitely not the brute. I don't take things by force. I must be a leech. Yeah. And leeches can crawl all the way up to <laughs> industrial. So I was going to try and better myself and I'm going to only produce things that I, that can benefit myself. Yeah. That's her philosophy. That's really, really good. So don't even remember your question, but help me a little bit. The question is how did you live your life out in the world yeah, yeah. Uh, amongst people who didn't share this practice? Yeah. So once I found this magic thing called Buddhism, I was so embarrassed that I was a witch doctor because that was still in my mind. <laughs> I'm like, Oh shit. I find myself like, obviously the industrialist isn't going to work out for me because I keep failing at businesses and I can't produce everything. Like my mind was in dissonance. There's no way I can make railways and a house and everything. I'll never be a perfect person that Anne Rand said. So I must, I must be a leech. And then I dropped down to once I met Buddhism and it had some results in meditation and some experiences. I'm like, I must be a witch doctor. So me practicing Buddhist philosophy out in the world meant this kind of um, 
double life and it felt just like being gay and pretending I wasn't. Yeah, it felt exactly like that for me. And so fortunately and unfortunately for me, at that time, I couldn't stay in the United States anymore. I couldn't study Buddhism. I find myself in Australia. Nobody knows me anymore because I moved all the way up to Cairns. And so I could really have my own identity, but I wasn't going to be a Buddha. So I decided out of all the Buddhist practices, what's the most fundamental thing I need to help others do in secret, in secret, help people change. People are always bothered with the uncertainty of life. If I can help them change and at the same time teach, they're two powerful karmas. Get rid of the sufferings of change, which you've done in that thing, and plant the seeds for teaching so I can get learning. So I became an organizational change person, teaching people how to manage change in large organizations with the secret Buddhist methodology that I would weave in in every meeting. So I had to find language where people saw the possibility in things. I infiltrated companies and got them to put into their customer service strategies. Think of customers like they are the source of your good. Think of others, right? And there's a practice to do that. Put yourself in the customer's shoes. Think of others, play, like bodhicitta practices. You know, you, the electricity company that I was working at at one point just thought they were giving electricity. And I was able to help the 4,000 people think that every electron was reaching a power point in their house and letting hot water warm up the tea of a mom, a hospital and the life support help a patient. They were no longer a business that were just doing electricity. All of a sudden, they were a business that were electrifying people's life for the better. Whoa. And I, it took me years to do that. And so every training had some aspect of, do you see that if you do this strategy or you do this strategy, it doesn't have much to do with the strategy, but with the intention that you bring it. So I tried to use Western psychology or the best I could. The act is still the act. Can I help others think of others? And can I do that with the best wisdom that's available to them? And so I was a closeted Buddhist for all those years until I realized I need more training. I, I reached my limit. And that's when I came back here in 2007, eight. Mm. And within that time or, or after coming back to the U.S., any experience within your life, like out in the world with family or friends, business, relationships, but any sort of life experience that rattled you to the point where uh, it really put this practice of vows to the test for you? Yeah, every, yeah, lots of times. <laughs> but there was one major time. So there, there were lots of times where our minds are funny. Like, I want the result now. I want the result now. I want the result now. Okay, I've done 10 years of this. Why am I not enlightened? You know, I've done 10 years of this. Why don't I have a big house? You didn't work for a house. You know, oh, what? And our minds are tricky. It wants all the goodness without the work. And if you understand the laws of karma, you can't get a result without a cause. So when the result isn't there, there's no cause that's arisen yet. It might be buried somewhere, so you better activate and work towards it. So many moments of doubt where I was frustrated that I didn't get what I want. Yeah, when, when I wanted. Mm. I was ignoring what I was getting. But there was this one particular moment. It was just about leaving Australia. By, that, by the time I was leaving Australia, there were people coming up to the workshops going, there's something else going on here, right? There's, you're teaching something more than just organizational change, right? So people were queuing on that I was trying to use the wisdom language from Buddhism and I couldn't contain it as much. And then I, I went, I decided I was going to be moving from Australia back to New York to connect to Geshe Michael and Three Jewels and that thing. Because that's my, the thing that started this experience in the first place. And I did more training. And so being a good change manager, meaning if you're going to shift identities, you need some in between, a bardo period. So I chose to spend five months in Nepal in 2008 between the move from Australia to here to just be in a place where my mind didn't have grounding, didn't know the language, didn't know the people, didn't know anything. And I didn't have to get a job. I was just going to be there and see what my experience was of there. And as soon as I landed, I met someone that told me that Geshe Michael was 
on the internet as denounced by the Dalai Lama, your holy teacher. Yet the only connection I have to rapture had all these bad articles about him and that he was a terrible person and there's all these bad press about him. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Now, I wasn't into the internet was sort of newish in 2008, at least for me, you know, like I wasn't going checking articles. And so, but I'm on my way to live in New York, take more teachings from this person. It's like the linchpin. It's like that. I didn't know everything was dependent on that teacher in my mind. He's the source of it revered in my mind like he was he he became the joseph campbell for me he was my connection to rapture his words every word was a challenge to wisdom and here is a monk who says oh don't trust that dude he's look at all the internet articles so he gave me all the internet articles and i spent a day reading all of them top to bottom and my heart started breaking moment by moment by moment the whole world fell apart what the hell have i done for 10 years like everything fails everything broken yeah i believe these words on the internet i believe them as truth forgot the karma and emptiness i just looked at them as facts i looked at someone else's opinion as my truth now there must have some validity you know, so I read every one to the end, went to bed completely despondent. This is not what I thought it was. Why am I moving back? Like the biggest doubt I've ever, 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 ever had. And then the next day I was invited by a, a high Tibetan Lama from the Sakya tradition to be part of this secret tantric puja, which I had no idea about. And I was the only Westerner and they sit me in a corner um and they sit me in the corner um and i'm like the westerner there i don't know 40 50 monks chanting i think it was three or four day puja in this awesome monastery um and in my mind was this poison like everything's wrong you wasted your life every like it was really heartbreaking it's like everything's ended now you're on the way to oblivion and um and then i'm like where the f am i like i'm in this dark room with tanka paintings right like with like it looks like that yeah but so much bigger <laughs> and much more stuff and if you've ever been in a tibetan monastery the symbols are going off and the trumpets are going off on the pujas and smoke fills the air and it, it's not a symphony it's eastern music it's annoying yeah it's like ding, 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 it's not like soothing yeah not to the western ear so my mind is already disturbed and someone's banging the cymbals and the bloody guy's doing the trumpet and he's wearing a red dress like a monk and he was really on the verge of destruction yeah and then my eye caught uh, an image of a Buddha that I recognized. And this little voice uh, said, how do you know what that Buddha is? It's just shapes on the wall. How would you know what that is? And then the next the next thought came, it's like, how do you know what Sangha, Chugi, so, you know, like the Tibetan words mean? Oh, how do you know what the meaning of incense means? And my mind began this un unraveling of the unraveling. It started showing the bliss in every one of those objects of the senses, the sight, the sound, the taste. And I realized I was swimming in Dharma. I'm like, I know the, I know they're doing the refuge prayer. I know they're making offerings. I know the possibility of enlightenment. I recognize these things. That's what they are. That's where you are. And were it not for the knowledge you took up from that teacher, Geshe Michael, you would not know that. I also know I removed a bunch of suffering to this point. I took ownership of my life to this point. 
and the rupture changed. It was so bizarre because it was like about to implode the universe and in its place, this power came over me in this thing. And I kept in the puja for the next few days and this certainty, this clarity, this removal of doubt came, hold on, it's your projection. And were it not for his words and Joseph Campbell, and all my efforts in keeping these promises, this would not have occurred. If I thought Geshe Michael from his own side was good or bad, self-existently, not dependent on my experience of him, then yes, that's true. If I thought this room was dependent, not dependent on my experience and projections of it, if it didn't depend on my projections, then it's a good or bad room or shitty music or good music. But I understood that day that my mind created the whole experience, including my relationship to the history of my teacher as seen by others. And it's a freeing experience. And that was like one of the, one of the anchors of my practice. And I can't give that away to people because you have to have your own moment of realizing how your mind projects your reality. Yeah. So that, I hope that answers your question. It was a really hard time, but it was the best time. Like it, everything was perfect. I decided to move to New York to connect to my teacher. And here is four months of real testing. Do you really want rapture? Because what if it depends on your projection? What if it depends on you? And all of a sudden I get that teaching in Nepal, in a monastery with a promise of tantric practice. You could look at it as the most awesome gift. You can't, you know, every, if suffering is empty of a nature, <laughs> then I could look at it with a samsaric self-existent perspective as suffering, or it could be rapture. And for me, it was so close. It was like the imploding of a universe and in its place, it was brilliance for me. I know for other practitioners, all the Geshe Michael stuff didn't work that way. That's okay. You know, it's not coming from him. It's not coming from Tibetan Buddhism. It's not coming. And the teaching is saying that something in each of us is generating our rapture or not. And if you don't get that, if you don't grab that, if you replace that with a self-existent Buddhist philosophy, at some point it will break. I hope that didn't freak anyone out. But yes, I was closeted and I did it very hidden. And I was like having ha 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 moments, lots of them, as I know that I'm putting specific words in corporate conferences that meant emptiness, but they didn't know, or, you know, change customer service strategies that meant take care of others and they didn't know, or used metaphors that would have people think of others like their mothers, but they didn't know, you know, that, that secrecy and taking charge of your own worldview had some power in the containment of it was my secret yeah uh, and i didn't find many people i went to many buddhist temples but they were all buddhists they were like i have to do the sutra this way because if i don't do the sutra nam yoho renge kyo then i will go to hell i wasn't interested in that buddhism i was interested in the buddhism that gives you the tools to manufacture your or to undo your suffering to experience the rapture. That, that is wake upism. That is, that's your Buddha nature. That's in every one of us. And the proof is sometimes you feel happy. Now, can you make that happy two minutes long, 10 minutes long, ultimately happy? That's it. If it's possible once, it's possible. Sorry, I rambled. No, it's beautiful. It, it, I feel like it touched on every single question at least I had remaining. So I hope uh, <laughs> everyone heard all the, the layers to that. I'll ask just one final question from the list that was submitted and then let's open it up. Hopefully it doesn't just become mayhem, but we could just unmute ourselves and, and ask anything else outstanding. But I have a sense of, of what the answer might be, but still curious for you, who are the living examples of bodhisattvas in your life that you, see and experience <laughs> who are they um Gisha michael is a perfect example for me he's controversial enough to wake you up what the hell are we doing make you nervous yeah 
um, and he's wise enough, like deep, like who could have come up with a stupid example? I hate the pen. You know, who could come up with such a stupid example that has every element <laughs> in one tiny line, you know, like, like that, that is the biggest Bodhisattva act that, you know, like there's tankers of deities that are holding the ball or the sword or whatever. The tanker of Geshe Michael in a thousand years will have a pen, you know, as teaching karma and emptiness. To be able to, for a Westerner, put those two together and anchor it to this uh, is the highest bodhisattva act I think anyone could ever do to this planet. To simplify the teaching so clearly that in that is contained everything we've covered I don't know anyone that's in my, in my experience of having direct contact. Then the, I'd have to say second is his holiness, the Dalai Lama. If you see his in, engagement with the world, if you see his skill to regardless of your nationality, your background, religion, to say to you, this is a, this technology is available to you because you are human. And the Chinese who'd like destroyed his homeland are not terrible people. They are just like you and me. And he loves them completely, you know, without that, like, that's a perfect example. That's a perfect example of a bodhisattva, a person that lives for the sake of everyone else. In my mind, I, I think they're living, breathing bodhisattvas. Sam has a follow-up question. How many times do you think you've taught the pen? And by extension, how many times do you think Geshe-la has taught the pen thing? Oh, too many, too many. Like, I, it's such a boring thing for me now. I'm like, oh, the pen, right? But it, I've gone through waves of teaching the pen. If you don't, if you don't get turned on by the pen, then you yet to get it, yeah? Now, I remember coming back to the United States from Australia. And the early Geshe Michael for me was a textual Geshe Michael. He'll sit there and go through line by line of the text and describe the Tibetan words, meaning this and that. So when I left Australia, it was like that. <laughs> yes, penness. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I like it. Thank you. He's got penness. Yeah. Um, so when I came back from Australia, he was teaching the pen. And it annoyed me to no end because I was into the intellectual understanding of very serious Buddhist concepts like the Majjhimika Prasangika school, which is different to the Svatantrika school because that's real Buddhism. You know, and here he is going, this doesn't have a nature. If it did, the dog would see it as a pen or you would see it as a choi toy. The fact that this object is neither means it's empty of a nature. I can get that. Now apply that to everything else. And then you have to question, where did the seeds come from? Coming this way or this way? This, you know, like, it's stunning. The, the complexity in that simple example is stunning. And if it doesn't turn you on, it's because you haven't heard the thing to be heard. And, but, but I came back to study real Buddhism and he's teaching this boring thing. So I remember psychologically disconnecting with him for about a year. Like, I'm not going to his classes. I'm not going to go and listen because he's going to teach the stupid pen thing again. You know, it's like, I'm more advanced than that. You know, and, and it took me a while to re-engage and see the beauty in here. So you have to, some people say a thousand times you have to listen to it. You need to listen to it until you understand it so clearly and then very quickly be able to place that logic the sequence of reasoning to the thing that hurts you most, the thing you love the most. If you can place that logic and reasoning to the thing that turns you on the most, then you're getting the pen. And if you can put that reasoning to the angriest, most terrible thing in your life, then this is refuge. Until then, you didn't get this. You know, as annoying as it is, it's annoying to hear it over and over. I do not disagree that that is our dependent arising experience. <laughs> yeah. It actually makes me think of one last thing I want to ask on behalf of everyone before we open it up. But in your opinion, Hector, what 
can, well, how many of us, are, over 50 of us on this call, what can we do tonight or whatever time zone we're all in after this call? What's the most powerful thing we could do with our minds and our bodies and the time we have if we yeah. got anything out of this conversation or out of engaging with three jewels? Um, yeah. What should we do? What should we do with this? Do not go on this. Yeah, do not let this dictate what should go in your mind next definitely not TikTok, then definitely not Instagram, then if definitely not Facebook, then definitely not your emails, definitely nothing in here because then they're going to tell you what you should put in your mind unless you have an advanced practice where you're looking for signs, okay? So if you're not having that advanced practice, then do not let your mind be taken by something else. The most important and wonderful thing you can do is recognizing that things don't have a nature, that my worldview doesn't have a nature. Grab yourself a cup of tea, take a moment to be uncomfortably seated by yourself or yourselves, and then rejoice on the beauty you've been able to find in these teachings for yourself. Just don't let your mind go into, oh, I'm no good at this. Just sit there and rejoice. Like, honestly, Tartuk, the beauty you've been able to see in this thing. Oh, wow, I saw the possibility of rapture. Oh, wow, I got the taste of what really wanting other people's happiness would be like. If I wasn't gripped by self-interest, I would really want others to experience that kiss. You know, if I, whatever the tiniest moment of bliss or rapture you've had, because you understood that things didn't come from their own nature, but because your mind made it so by impulse, then rejoice on that. And then at some point, once you've reached that rejoicing, just give it away. Like imagine other people can find that rapture in whichever form in a, in a, in a prayer of Catholic church in a, you know, banging crystals in a voodoo ceremony. I don't, it doesn't matter. May they just find that rapture for themselves, this recognition that my mind just experienced some divine thing. And it's in my mind, like just that realization. I would rejoice in that as much as you can tonight. Yeah, I like that question. Thank you. Thank you so much. We still have a, a few minutes. So as I said, feel free to unmute yourself and join the conversation. But thank you for sharing so openly, Hector. So and maybe you time. can moderate. People can just put on the chat that they want to ask a question and then yeah, you- Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have already sent their questions to the chat privately, which we went over. So if you have anything you think everyone would want to hear, share, yeah, please share it now with the chat. And maybe while we wait for that, Hector, how can people um, uh, keep learning from you? When are you teaching? How are you accessible? Yeah, I, I wish I was teaching more at Three Jewels. Like, I love this. If we could do more of these Q&A sessions, I'd be very happy to share because I think it's important to get shortcuts on. There's so much to be had here. It can be overwhelming. I've forgotten because I'm fully committed now. I'm deeply committed. It's been 24 years. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not doubting anymore. But it did take me effort to get there. And if I can give anyone any help or inkling of help towards overcoming a certain obstacle and the rest. I'm very happy to do it in a very sort of candid, open way. I'm really enjoying that we, we're talking about these things, if it's helpful. So I don't get to teach that often. So being able to do more of this would be nice. Yeah. Um, and then um, I chose three jewels as my object of how do I give back? When I moved back to the United States, I moved back with a job and a whole bunch of things, but then I realized very quickly that I had to keep the karmas going for the wisdom I was getting from this place, from this community and the rest. So my devotion to Three Jewels became like me creating a space where you could all grow and learn. That became my practice. It be so if there's anything you could do, if you want the courses for more teachings, Help Three Jewels remain in the world. Help Three Jewels get more classes, teach more people, have more programs, uh, 
function in New York City, attend the classes, be part of this group, be part of that group, become a member, donate, take care of, take care of the place that takes care of everyone's mind. If that would be something uh, that would make me blissfully happy. Yeah. And, and it needs it. Like it's an organic volunteer run thing and it's only as good as the people in it. Yeah. And at the moment it's brilliant. At the moment it's stunning. Um, and so that, that would make me happy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that is the answer you wanted. No, just giving people ways to, to reach you and, and get in touch. Yeah. With you. you can reach me there. Keeping three jewels going. You can reach my heart. <laughs> And then a couple of questions coming in on the chat. Yeah. Hot and fast from Zoe. What's so, the... so why don't you just invite those people to talk? You choose yeah. who the questions are so then, then they don't feel like they're all jumping in. You say, Zoe, ask. Yeah. Okay, Zoe, ask. Try to, try to condense maybe the two, both of them into one. Please. They're completely different, but I'll start with the more important one. The, I, the more relevant one is, um, and by the way, thank you, Hector. The sure. more relevant one is how do you practice diligently without with someone angry or um, negative bias? Like that's their thing, you know, like how could you practice with someone like that? So um, diligently uh, without coming off as passive aggressive. When someone is angry at me, you mean? Yeah. All the time. All the time. Yeah. I mean, so, a couple of things. Number one, I always say it's my projection. Yeah. This could be something else. And that's refuge straight away. This does not have to piss me off. Often people have, so think about the emptiness of the situation at the beginning. It doesn't matter that they've done it for 10,000 times. Yeah. It's still available to change because without that possibility, it will remain self-existent. So in my mind, it would be, and I've had this, I mean, I've had people yell at me. I still have people yell at me. Understand that that is available for change. It's empty of a nature, but my mind is having this experience. It is arising. It comes from somewhere in my mind. So acknowledge that that's refuge. Yeah. And then you go ahead and depending on your capacity or strength at the time, you use your, the best thing you can use out of your weapon of knowledge. And if you want, you can go to Master Shanti Deva and says, be a bump on the log. Like, don't react. Don't say anything shitty back. At bare minimum, don't. But if it's abusive, get your hell out of the room. Get yourself out of the relationship. Get yourself away from things. If you can't engage in a positive way, if you're going to do a lojong, a, a lojong practice, you're going to be standing there in front of that person saying, I love you. I'm so sorry you feel that way. But not if you can't sustain it, you know, not if they can't hear it, not if you know it's doing harm. So that's why all these practices are just tools to engage with whatever is arising. But never forget that whatever is arising is up for change, up for transformation, because it doesn't have a nature. Has anybody ever yelled at you and you just laughed it off as if they're crazy? Or someone yelled at you the same decibels or the same anger and you just never took it personally. Or someone just seemed crazy to you or someone seemed that they misunderstood. Of course, there's opportunity for that experience to have a million different ways to be interpreted. And currently, it is someone aggressively coming at you. But it's only that way because your mind is forcing you to experience it that way. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It does exist in that way because of pain. Yeah. So there's all these different methods from get yourself out of the room, stay very still, take, be compassionate to them, either verbally or compassionate to them by not giving them an opportunity to plant more karmas, but do not get angry at them because you're getting angry at the wrong thing. Yeah, if you're angry at them that they're assholes and whatever, you misunderstood where they are coming from. And that is the practice because you're just planting more anger. If, you, if you're in the practice of this, this is just an experiment to get rid of the angry yelling person. Yeah, you have to think about it that way. For me, it was the angry boss example. And I've done it many times since. Just getting rid of one angry boss doesn't get rid of all the angry bosses. <laughs> 
Next question. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you. So Priya, you're gonna? Yeah, I'm looking at Jeremiah Rowland. Has a question. Hi, Hector. Hi, hey, Hector. Jeremiah. Um, thank you so much. It was really nice to hear your personal experience uh, around these vows. They make me nervous. We learned them in detail for the, like Sophia said, in the last 12 weeks. And um, I guess my question is like, you talked a lot about the non-self-existent nature of a lot of the vows themselves or our ideas around the vows. But I also didn't really hear you talk about the other extreme that we potentially fall into, that these vows don't matter that the nihilistic perspective <laughs> or as like a way of get out of jail free cards. Some like, can you speak to that in the sense of like, have you ever kind of come close to doing that or? Often, not just come close. I've completely self, uh, what do you call it when you? Sabotage? Yeah, not self-sabotage, where you'd fake it, like you believe something that's not true, but it's a positive thing. Uh, it's sort of- you make it? Like uh, delude yourself? I deluded myself in thinking I was keeping the vows and I was just being lazy and just using it many times. I've used it as an excuse to let my, my afflicted, misunderstanding nature take life many times. We, I mean, you're going to do that. Just don't be hard on yourself, but don't be so soft on yourself that you'll never get up. Yeah. So it's a balance. And for each one of us, that is different. That's a different thing. I've worked myself to the point of too much, nearly breaking myself. That's not healthy. I've relaxed myself so much around these vows to the point that I just read them. I just read them. I don't even think about the implication. That's not healthy because it's not energy. I want rapture. So you've got to find some kind of anchor that says, oh, and honestly, some weeks you're not going to have the energy and it's okay. It's okay. If you're there for the long haul, if you're there for the rapture all the way to death and beyond. Yeah. If you're there for that, if you understand that with conviction that this is a transformation for this life and beyond that, okay, I'm committed to this cause picket fence, one and a half dogs, two children, coffin, or can that be something else? I'm up for the experiment. So for me, I'm, I'm for the rapture. So I'm so committed to this. I'm going to make it work. And you need that kind of pull and motivation and clarity to say, I'll keep doing it for years. I had my foot in both the coffin and the rapture. Yeah. And then at some point now I'm on the rapture side. That takes time. It takes experiences. Keep falling down. The one bit of evidence, uh, the one bit of advice I could give you for the state of mind that relaxes too much or that holds on too tight is you have to get up off of those things one more time than you fall down. So make that commitment to yourself. Make what, whatever you find yourself in, fallen to laziness or fallen to overcommitment get up more than the one more time than you've fallen down. That's a shortcut for me. Go, okay, you're feeling this way. It's changeable in the next millisecond. Get your ass up. Getting your ass up for me means get my ass to the cushion, read a vow, get your ass up means do something different than what you were doing before. That's all. Just make that next step because it's changeable now. Like right now, if you feel like shit, you don't have to change, feel like shit next moment. You can change now. You were feeling like shit up until now. Okay, I'm going to move my body out of now. Yeah, you know? Thanks, Jeremiah. Because of time, can I ask that Nicholas and then Maya ask your questions back to back? Maybe they're related, um, but at least we'll have both of them out in the ether then. Hi, Nicholas. Hi, Hector. Um, I want to be sensitive about this question. And I've had this question about Geishi Michael Roach for a long time. I don't know exactly what the controversy is besides what I read on Wikipedia. Uh, did you ask your teacher about the controversy? And did he <laughs> confirm or deny yeah, yeah. anything? And would it matter 
uh, if it were true or if it wasn't true? Or yeah, yeah, great question. Know. Yeah, yeah. And that, I think it's healthy. It's a good thing to talk about. Uh, of course, I read all that stuff on the internet. They accused him of all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, first of all, the monastic set accused him of having sexual relations with someone. And then the and and eventually and eventually marrying someone, which he did, yeah, as a monk, which sounds weird. And then uh, to the other extreme, they uh, they said that his main student Christie uh, had had gotten crazy because of his teachings or something like this, and had not not gone crazy. It's the wrong thing to say. Uh, her partner died and they p tried to pin it on Geshe Michael. Yeah. So they're both really serious things. And there's a bunch of other things in there. So yes, I read it. Yes. It bothered me. That didn't change the fact that understanding this for me gave me the tools to transform my life. It didn't change the fact that every Zonkapa word that he translated is better translated than any other word i go and check to make sure he translated it right yeah for me those controversies gave me extra diligence to double check his work and every time i'd come up wow that translation is amazing <laughs> every time my god he did the entire 18 courses so the controversy that initially nearly shrunk my world gave me a kind of you better check what you're getting into attitude which gave me more diligence what a blessing for me yeah um so that's the first thing then over the years i i didn't want to ask him but i felt it kept bothering my mind so i made a long appointment with him and i sat with him face to face and i asked him all my controversy questions what about this and what about that and if it's, this is true, and I, and I keep apologizing, I'm like, I see you as a holy person and I, every teaching you've ever given. So I did it with the utmost respect, but I needed to clear my doubts because if I was going to teach this stuff to others, I needed clarity. Yeah. Look at me in the eye, holy teacher. It's like, imagine going up to the Dalai Lama and going, listen, is what China says, is what China say true? Are you the devil? Yeah, it, it'd be difficult to do to the Dalai Lama, right? But if you had doubt, if you were, if you grew up in China and for 50 years, someone told you the Dalai Lama is the devil because he wants to separate people from China, which he does because people in China think Tibet is China, right? And you had to, you're a Chinese person. You're like, Dalai Lama, listen, I like what you're teaching, compassion, but do you really want to hurt China? Because, you know, like, What's the answer to that? But to look at them in the eye and ask them, I had that opportunity and I, I was moved to tears with his answers. Enough for me. And, and yes, he was married. There isn't a law that says monks can't be married. Yeah. Yes, uh, he was doing some strange secret practices that other monks and nuns do but don't publicize but his belief is that those practices aren't going to fly in the West. And so he sort of outed this secret partner practice that you do mentally and with some activity in, in the secret teachings, not for us, advanced teachings. He sort of ousted that and said, no, you can't have a woman that's equal to you in practice that you are together trying to have an experience and keep her in the closet that won't fly in the West. So the monastics, the people trying to keep the establishment who are doing all these practices. So that's radical. You're a, whatever happened in the church of England, like that's too radical. But I think, I actually think his, his act was an act of truth. Yeah. And I'm, it does not change at all. The fact of karma and emptiness, it does not change the fact that I have to change my mind. It does not change anything at all i mean they can put garbage on him my transformation was thanks to that guy's teaching and so for me it's enough and you don't yeah. no one needs to be a fan of geshe michael no one needs to be a fan of reality to engage with reality yeah <laughs> like that's my answer and it's not too controversial to ask it it's just like 
you don't want to be talking about it all the time, you know, because there's all this other stuff to talk about. So Priya, thanks. Thank I hope you. that helped everyone, by the way, because it's a sort of, oh, don't talk about it. It's okay to talk about it. I want to make sure Maya has a chance to ask her question. Yeah. I, hi, thank you. I realize we're coming to the end. So um, you spoke to this with um, Jeremy's question, Jeremiah's question, um, about this sort of space between rigidity and lethargy in mm -hmm. finding a path forward and sort of starting with small movements. I'm just going to move my body. I'm going to do one small thing different. Um, I hope this helps other people, but it's something I struggle with, with going towards, I want to be all or nothing. I want to do every single ACI course and all of the homework and I want to be perfect at it. And if I'm not perfect at it, I'm going to disappear for four months and not talk to three jewels. You know, like this has been a habitual thing. It's been a cycle. And so I want to hear your thoughts on how to build those small movements into a more committed practice, like taking a vow. How do we um, work towards that and recognizing that we are remote, we're, um, we're not able to be in person in, in the communities we're used to. Um, what, what's a path forward? Yeah, it's a beautiful question. Like it's so overwhelming. It's like you've just opened a door to an infinite paradise and the map is so detailed. It's 3d and in miniature, like it's so much, right? So my answer is a simple answer. We're studying the Bodhisattva vows, the wish to get enlightened for the sake of every being. If I can figure out this enlightenment, then I, I want that for everyone. And you are one of everyone too. So my answer is be kind to yourself first and foremost. Like really be genuine. And kind doesn't mean just be nice when you're lazy, let yourself be lazy. But be gentle enough in the path. Like be gentle enough that you know you could be there next week and next week and be there for the long haul. And if two weeks, because it really is an orbit, yeah? You're going to meet these problems in your life. If you leave three jewels and you leave the spiritual path and you don't meditate, it'll be three years. And then you're like, Oh shit, I've got to meditate because everything else you took refuge in will fall apart. It just does. I can say that after decades. Yeah. So it's better to have small sustained commitment than all or nothing. Cause that, that burns too quickly. Yes. Yeah, so I have a snot. Don't put all the wood on the fire at once and be okay with it. It's a thing I struggle with. I'll give you an example. For me, Holy Geshe Michael is teaching all around the world all the time. I want to be in Arizona when he teaches. I want to be with him all the time. I've committed myself to building three jewels. That's my commitment. And it's mentally, it's my service to him and the lineage of minds that have transformed themselves because of these teachings. Him. Ken Rinpoche, Trijan Rinpoche, Pabonka Rinpoche, all the way up to Tsongkhapa and the Buddha. These beings, like us, sat in Zoom meetings at some point and tried to wake up. <laughs> but there were different Zooms. There were meditative Zooms. Yeah. And they invested their entire lives. Holy Ken Rinpoche, his entire life. Monastery bombed, ran out the door with a few books. And thanks to him, we're here. If he didn't do the entire life, we would not be here. Geshe Michael would not be here. ACI would not be here. This dude ran across the, the Himalayas to get to India to teach and then moved to New Jersey. And thanks to him, an entire life of practice that was sustained and long term, not short. Yeah, that's why we're here. And so my short answer is be kind to yourself but be there for the whole race. Yeah. And so you be gentle. And then for me, there are a couple of techniques remain connected to other people that the, the beautiful thing that I see about three jewels. And I'm so happy that Supriya's taught this course. And I'm so happy that the last, the last group of teachers that have finished and graduated from the meditation program, the teachers that graduated from the yoga program and the volunteers that help run this space. I'm so happy that you are together. Because when someone is down, the group can hold you up. And it's okay. That's what they're there for. Yeah, because you would do it for them. If people around you were a little, I can't do a meditation. 
then have a cup of tea with them. And that connection is enough. It is really necessary to have a group of people because what we're doing is radical renovations to samsara. Yeah, you're, you're, and you need help. You can't do it on your own. You need help. Teachers, you need to know the knowledge and then you can't let your mind bring you back to the broken. And so sometimes you're going to be up. You'll help other people who are down. So remaining in community is vital, I think, you know, uh, for the long race. Because initially when I was younger, I used to think I had to win at Buddhism. You know, Stephen now is doing that. But I used to think I had to like be perfect, you know. And no, if I had to be perfect, I wouldn't need Buddhism. If I was perfect, I didn't need transformation. Of course, not perfect. And, and these tools, I've, I've seen them perfect states of mind. I wish, you know, like, and, and this is, I think, the last thing I'll say. In that long-term journey, there will be two or three jewels. No more. Two or three jewels. Like that moment in the monastery in Nepal, it fills my body with bliss. It was a pivotal moment for me. And there have been moments of insight in meditation or in retreat. There have been moments of complete connection with a person because of these teachings. The moment my mom died, and having these teachings alive in me and her, there'll be pivotal key moments in the long race that are enough, that just enough for all the other failures to be sustained. I didn't do all the homeworks. I didn't do all the quizzes. I'm such a bad person. They pale in comparison to those few jewels that are yours. They're your awakening moments. They're your connection to rapture. And they won't come if you don't stay the long haul. You'll battle all the time. So I just say, be kind to yourself and, and remain connected, really. Yeah. Thank you, Hector. Thank you again. I actually just remembered this, but or I mean, I've been thinking about it, but for those of you who have maybe forgotten and started this course, uh, today might have been earmarked in your calendar this evening as an opportunity to actually take on Bodhisattva vows, right? We had said, oh, we're gonna have a ceremony at Three Jewels and you can come and you can take the vows or you can come in as an observer and, and ask for the wish to get the wish, right? And of course we can't, do that right now. We don't um, have that availability, but I couldn't think of, of anything sweeter than this um, as an alternative. So thank you for your time and your stories and opening your heart. Hector does teach meditation on Three Jewels Online. That's what I was getting at earlier in terms of if you want to access him more. Oh, sorry. We all know that, that we have <laughs> classes um, online. And just for all of you, because you know you really are the, the core um, community that we have here, the people that are magnetized to the Dharma, we want you to know, share the online membership with those who you know. You know what Hector said, have that cup of tea with others. And just for you all, give them this code. It's one word, virtual jewel, virtual jewel, one word. If you give them that code, they'll get half off their first class or like a one week trial with us. Um, so a great opportunity, you know, recommend teachers, go to class with them. I think more people than we know right now, like especially the strong ones, the friends who seem to have it all together. Um, so just giving that to all of you, you can share it widely on social or amongst friends and other communities that you have. Um, and stay close. I hope you do do this again for us, Hector. That would be amazing. Um, well, I think we decided that for ACI 8, which will uh, announce what to do until ACI 8, I'm happy to hold a few of these kind of sessions to try and let some practices seep in and so look out for those we'll we'll put them out for tuesday nights yeah and i think they'll, they'll be nice and healthy around a theme or something yeah but i really like the format you asking questions uh that that are practical about a specific topic lets me really share some of the practices which you know they all come from aci it's just what i've been able to use and hopefully you you can share your insights at some future time or in, in these sessions as well to help each other grow. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Well, well, we're going to end this meeting because there's a class with uh, the lovely Miriam at 10, a meditation. So 
let's pop off. But thanks all, um, or, or Santi, it's with Santi? Santi's subbing tonight. Oh, okay, it's with Santi, who's right here. So if you want to meditate on love, right? What's the topic? Uh, uh, inner guide. Inner guide, very fitting. Inner guide. A PM. teacher. So we're gonna hop, we're gonna hop <laughs> off of this so that you have um, the Zoom. But it's so nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a beautiful evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. It's a blessing to share.